it's recording. It's true. Really, okay, great. Um, test. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, just want to start with a quick review of what we uh, looked at last week. Okay. So last week we talked about the t test for independent samples of data. Okay. And the idea there was we wanted to um, just we want to look at two samples of data and see what the samples say about their respective populations. Okay, in particular, we want to know is it possible that the two populations have the same mean? Okay, or um, do we have evidence that the population means are different? Okay, and so the claim that we are testing we call the null hypothesis, and we write something like mu one is equal to mu two. Okay, and then the alternative would be something like mu1 is not equal to mu2, or depending on the question, we might say mu1 is greater than mu2, or mu1 is less than mu2, you know, or conversely, they can be rearranged, so you say that the difference mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero, or mu1 minus mu2 is less than zero, okay? And, um, and so anyway, the, um, we go through these calculations, right, and we arrive at something called the p-value. The p-value, we uh, the definition is it is the probability of observing our data's test test statistic for something more unusual if we assume that the null hypothesis were true. So I think in in our example, I said uh, you know we took one sample of carrots from the farmers market, another sample of carrots from the grocery store. And the average weight of one sample was 65 grams, and the average weight of the other sample was 70 grams, right? And if the null hypothesis were true, we would expect the two samples to have the same average, but they came out to be different. And so if the, uh, if the samples come out to be different, does that mean the populations then have different means, okay? And so the question is, what is the probability of observing this difference of five grams, if we assumed that the null hypothesis were true. If we assumed that the populations do have the same mean, okay, um, then yes, we would expect most of our, our samples to have the same mean, but because of random chance, the samples will have a little bit of difference, right? And so we wanna know, well, what's the probability that we get a difference of five? And so, um, um, so in our case, um, we say, what's the probability of getting a difference of 5 grams or minus 5 or something more unusual? And in our case, more unusual means minus 5 or something more negative. And it also means positive 5 or something more positive, greater, greater than that as well. Okay? And so we, we went through calculations, right? And, and this stuff... The standard error, it should look familiar because that's the standard error from our um, confidence interval for a difference in means, okay? And, um, and we did the calculations. Uh, we had to use the t-table to figure out our tail probabilities. And, uh, and I hope this looks familiar. And so we said, you know, the number we have, our value is 2.097, and that's in between 2.197 and 2.086, and therefore our tail area, we don't have an exact value, but we do know it's between 2 and 2.5%. Two and okay, and so if I double that, because we're looking at both uh, the negative 5 and the positive 5, if I double that, we know our final probability has to be between 4 and 5%. And so this is the um, conclusion page. And so what it means when we say our p-value is between 4 and 5%, then the interpretation there is that if the two populations do have the same mean, and I think this is what I still have open here, if the two populations do have the same mean, then it is possible for two random samples you know, I take a random sample from this population, a random sample from this population, and the two populations have the same mean, okay? It's possible that you end up with a difference of 5 or negative 5 
or you know something more unusual just from sam from random sampling okay um, and that's going to happen somewhere between four and five percent of the time and so now we're faced with a choice and our choice choices are you know one person can say you know the probability that this happens is less than five percent okay um, and so you know it's possible that we were one of the lucky five percent okay but I'm gonna I'm gonna say you know five percent is pretty low and I don't think I was one of those unusual five percent right and so you know I'm gonna doubt my sample was the result of random coincidence and therefore we conclude that the two populations do have different means. So that's one possible conclusion. Okay. The other possible conclusion, you, looking at the same data and the same result, is to say, you know, four to five percent is a small value, but it's not something we can just ignore. Okay. I'm not ready to just dismiss the possibility that the, my data was just a kind of a, a random result of sampling. And so I'm not ready to conclude that the populations have different means. Do those do both of those conclusions make sense? Okay, and and so um, the question here is when where should we like who's right is person A right or is person B right? Okay, and the answer is we don't know who's right. Okay, and um, and I guess the other question is you know should we be person A or should we be person B? And the answer you know, just like everything else is, it depends. It depends on the situation. You know, what is the consequence of coming to a conclusion, you know, coming to the wrong conclusion? Um, and, um, and so we're gonna take a look at that uh, here, okay? So, so we went through the process last week of getting to our p-value, and today we're gonna talk about uh, taking this p-value and making an appropriate conclusion and un really understand, or at least trying to understand um, its, its meaning here, okay? Um, one, uh, I guess one thing to note is that most uh, journals, uh, well, maybe not most, well, so this policy has come under a lot of fire, is that a lot of, um, a lot of journals, medical journals, scientific journals, and things like this, um, just kind of have a, a blanket p-value 5% policy and meaning that for them to even consider publishing uh, an, an article, the resulting p-value has to come be less than 5%, all right? And, um, and if it's less than 5%, then they're willing to publish it. If it's greater than 5%, they're probably not willing to publish it. Um, that that policy has come under fire, uh, you know, quite a bit in the last decade, um, because uh, you know probably our, our thinking needs to be a little bit more nuanced. Uh, there's a push by some people to get kind of the p-value that we should look at to be like less than one percent, um, for us to say it's small, uh, small enough to reject the null hypothesis and all of that. Uh, so you know, a lot of a lot of debate. Um, you can look up the null hypothesis significance testing debate, and um, there I don't know. People will have strong opinions on the subject. Okay, but um, but let's let's talk about this, right? All right. So my first question, or the first slide, will be: How do we decide whether a p-value is large or small? How do we decide whether to be person A that says, yeah, I came under 5%, that's small enough. I'm going to reject the null hypothesis, conclude that there's a difference between populations, population means. Or how do I decide to be person B? 4 to 5%, not small enough for me. I'm going to, I'm not ready to say that there's a difference between the population means. Okay? And so, you know, again. Uh, when we make conclusions, 
the, uh, the idea is this, right? If the p-value is small, whatever small means to us, okay, um, if the p-value is small, we say that our observed data unlikely to happen by random chance when the null hypothesis is true. Okay. And so, you know, the fact that our data did happen, right? We did get our observed data. Um, leads us, or you know, provides evidence. To I'm going to say reject the null hypothesis. So that's what we say. If the p-value is small, we say that our observed data is unlikely to happen by random chance when the null hypothesis is true. Okay? And the fact that we did get our observed data then tells us that our initial assumption about the null hypothesis being true is wrong, and that's why we're going to reject it. Okay, and on the other hand, if the p-value is large, whatever um, whatever large means, okay, you know, we say that our observed data. has a reasonable chance of, of happening by randomness alone. Okay. And so, um, so therefore, um, or I should say, of happening by randomness alone when uh, the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so therefore, you know, we do not have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, and so, um, you know, the process is that at the beginning, before we even do the analysis, we're supposed to pick a significance level called alpha. So, um, I'll let you guys catch up and we'll flip to the next slide. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the conclusions that we make, all right? And um, okay, and so so before we begin our analysis, okay, we should select a significance level.
alpha. Okay, and the symbol for alpha looks like an A. Uh, it's a Greek letter for A. Okay, and uh, an alpha is an arbitrary value that we select. Okay, and once we've selected an alpha, basically the decisions are based on our p-value versus alpha. Okay, so if the p-value is alpha, I'm sorry, p-value is less than alpha, we consider our p-value to be small, right? So previous slide we said if our p-value is quote-unquote small. p-value small means p-value is less than alpha. Okay, and if your p-value is small, then ultimately we reject the null hypothesis. Or we say we have evidence. We have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. And on the other hand, if the p value is greater than alpha, we consider our p-value to be, quote, large. And we would say, we say we do not have evidence. To reject the, uh, the null hypothesis, okay? Um, note, uh, we will never say we accept the null hypothesis, okay? So it's either we reject it or we do not reject it. We never say we accept it, okay? Okay. So um, common choices are alpha equal to 0 0.05, okay? Uh, also common is alpha equal to 0 0.01. Um, you can have other values as well, but uh, I would say these are probably you know, your, your most common choices for alpha. Alpha is equal to 5% or 1%. Now, how do we decide what alpha we should use, right? So last time, our p-value was somewhere between 4 and 5%. So if I had picked alpha to be 1%, you know, 4% is bigger, my p-value is bigger than alpha, I would say we do not have re evidence to reject the null. It would be person B, okay? If I had chosen alpha to be 5%, okay, with my p-value being between 4 and 5%, then I know my p-value is less than alpha, and I would consider my p-value to be small, and we would reject the null. So we'd say we have evidence that the two com you know, brands of carrots, farmer's market versus grocery store carrots, are different. Um, and on the other hand, if our p-value, if our alpha was small, with the same p-value, we would say, you know, I'm not ready to make that conclusion. Maybe what I saw was a result of random chance. Okay, so how do we decide what kind of significance level? Like, should I go with significance level, alpha 1% or alpha 5%? You know, can I pick alpha 10% or alpha, like, 0 0.0001, okay? Um, can I do that? Right? Um, yes, you can. It's an arbitrary value. Whatever value, whatever number you want to pick, that's allowed. Okay? 
Um, but let me just kind of tell you what it means to have different, different choices of alpha, right? So our significance level, alpha, Uh, is equal to the probability probability of making what we call a type this is an unfortunate name type 1 error okay so Kind of uh, modern statistics with this whole hypothesis testing stuff. I don't know if we would say this modern, but this hypothesis testing, I would say, was established, you know, early 1900s, like the 19, uh, 19-teens, 1920s, something around there. And, uh, you know, Ronald Fisher is kind of the, uh, the father of all of this. He re re realized that there were two types of mistakes that were inherent to the process of null hypothesis testing and um, he didn't have a good way to name them so he called them type 1 error and type 2 error and uh, and later on we came up with better names okay we have the false positive and the false negative and I think those are a little bit better but the the names type 1 and type 2 are um, have stuck around in the literature and so so we have to learn them as well okay but they unfortunately Type 1 and type 2 are completely non-descriptive, um, but that's just what it is, okay? Um, okay, so the type 1 error is um, also known as the false positive. Okay, and basically what this means is um, our conclusion is to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. But this was the wrong decision because in real life, in reality, the null hypothesis is actually true. Okay, so, because um, remember, we are making conclusions based on limited data. And so, you know, of course, if we knew the reality of the situation, we would never make these mistakes. But the reality is, is that uh, the null hypothesis is actually true, but for whatever reason, our data, our random sample came back a little bit funny, and it leads us to conclude um, that we should reject the null hypothesis, right? So in our example, with the carrots example, okay, the null hypothesis is mu1 is equal to mu2, or in other words, um, farmer's market and grocery store carrots have the same same mean weight. Okay, so this is the hypothesis. Okay, so in the carrots example, this means we come to the conclusion that there is a difference. between um, population, population means. Okay? But the truth is that there's no difference. 
maybe we just got a weird sample of data that led us to the wrong conclusion. Okay, so, so that could happen, right? And it's not that we did anything wrong in our process, okay? We're just trying to make a conclusion based on limited random data. And sometimes because of randomness, you get weird samples. And sometimes that weird sample will lead you to con conclude that there's, really, that there's a difference between the two groups when in reality there is none, okay? And so, you know... You know, I always wonder this, right? Like, is there a difference between the organic fruit at the grocery store and the non-organic fruit? Because the organic fruit costs a little bit more. Maybe there's a difference, maybe there's not, right? Um, and I, I don't know, you, you can do a study, and um, but we don't know the truth, right? We only know, we can only look at some random sample of data, and I don't even know what the question is, but <laughs> how you would even uh, look at this, but um, a false positive would be you believe there's a difference when in reality there's none. Okay? Uh, a false negative is that there is actually a difference, but you don't think there is. Okay? But we'll talk about that in a moment. Right? So um, does this kind of make sense, what's happening here, this idea of a false positive? Okay? Um, and one thing to note is that the type 1 error is unavoidable. Okay. It's just um, part of the process, okay? Um, anytime you have to make a conclusion without knowing everything, which is always, right? Unless we can observe the entire population, which is um, the opposite of statistics, right? So statistics is like we can't observe the whole population, so we have to go off of the limited data. Uh, anytime you're working with limited data, it's possible that what you see is not truly representative. And so this, um, the type 1 error is unavoidable, right? There's always a possibility that you get a weird random sample that leads you to the wrong conclusion, okay? So type 1 error is unavoidable. Um, whenever, whenever we make a conclusion, based on a sample and not the entire population. Okay, we could be making a mistake. Okay, so even though it's unavoidable, the fact that alpha is equal to the probability of making a type 1 error gives us some control, right? So we get to choose our alpha. Alpha is the significance level that we choose, and therefore we do have control over, um, I guess, my risk of type 1 error, okay? We do get to choose... We do get to choose alpha. Alpha is equal to the probability of type 1 error. Okay, so, you know, we get to choose, uh, you know, I guess our risk of making a type 1 error. So if alpha is equal to 0 0.05, we have a 5% 0 0.05 chance of making type 1 error. Is that okay? 
So if that's the case, and you say, well, I don't want to make type 1 error, why don't I just pick a small alpha? Okay. Why don't I just pick a small alpha to reduce Um, that's that's a fair question, right? Because we get to choose, we get to choose alpha, and if alpha is the risk of making a type one error, why don't I just choose to minimize my risk of type one error? Okay, that seems fair. All right, but the um, so the the trade off is that decreasing alpha to reduce will reduce type one error or uh, the risk of type one error, but um, but will increase the risk of making the type 2 error. So there's a flip side, okay? So, um, decreasing alpha reduces risk of type 1 error, but will increase risk of type 2 error. Okay. So type 2 error this is known as our false negative. Okay. The type 2 error is our conclusion is do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So our conclusion is do not reject the null hypothesis because you know whatever your p-value comes in greater than alpha. But if this is an error, but this conclusion is a mistake. Our conclusion is do not reject the null hypothesis, but this conclusion is wrong because in reality, the null hypothesis is not true and should be rejected. Okay, so you know in our carrot example, okay. so again the null hypothesis are that the two populations have the same mean. Okay, and so uh, type two error would be okay. We conclude or we say that we do not have evidence. Uh, we do not have evidence that the two populations have different mean weights. Okay. So we say that we do not have evidence that the two populations have different mean weights, but the truth of the matter is, is that if we did look at the entire population, they do have different means, okay? But in reality, if we look at the entire populations, Okay, but in reality, if we look at the entire populations, um, 
the, the populations have different means. So kind of um, the summary, oops. is alpha is equal to the probability of making a type 1 error and beta, so we have uh, letters. So alpha goes with type 1 error. Beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet. And this is the probability of a type 2 error. All right. And uh, in general, um, decreasing alpha increases beta and uh, increasing alpha decreases beta. Okay. Um, we get to select alpha directly. Um, we do not have direct control over beta. Beta is indirectly related to alpha, but there's uh, other factors that uh, also affect beta. Okay, so we do not direct control over beta. Um, there's also a special thing. One minus beta is known as known as power. The power of a test, and so this is probability of not making type two error. I'm trying to squeeze everything on this bottom slide here, okay? Uh, well, what does it mean not to make a type 2 error? So type 2 error is we say that we do not have evidence that the two populations have different mean weights, but in reality, um, well, if we look at the entire populations, the populations have different means, okay? So type 2 error is... Um, the false negative. Okay, so not making a type two error would be basically the true negative, the probability of correctly rejecting the null when the null is false. So if, you know, if the two, I don't know, populations of carrots truly are different, what's the probability that we come to that correct conclusion? Okay, what's the probability that we are, we are going to reject that null hypothesis? And so um, sometimes you'll hear about power studies, trying to figure out exactly how much data needs to be collected so you can make the uh, correct conclusion and things like that. I know it's a lot of text. Um, is this okay? Kind of all of this stuff here. All right, so um, 
All right. So I still haven't gotten to, you know, how do we decide whether we should have a big or small alpha, okay? So what we need to do, what you're supposed to do is you should look at the consequences of making a type 1 or type 2 error, and that should inform whether you should use a large or small alpha, okay? You should look at the consequences of making a type 1 or type 2 error. And um, um, we should look at the consequences of making a type 1 or type 2 error, and that should affect whether we or that should inform whether we should pick a large or small alpha. Okay, so if the type 1 error is worse, we would pick a small alpha. Okay, so if, I guess, the consequences type 1 error is worse, we pick a small alpha. So, you know, again, alpha is equal to the probability of a type 1 error. Okay. And on the other hand, if type 2 error is worse, okay, we pick a large alpha. All right, so uh, so let's try. Here's a scenario. All right, so we'll say a patient visits a doctor for I don't know disease screening. Okay. And so in general, we assume patients are healthy unless they show some symptoms of an illness or something, right? So, Okay, so we have the null hypothesis. We are going to say the patient is healthy. And then the alternative hypothesis will be that the patient is not healthy. Patient is in need of medical att attention. So, uh, you know, the ideal scenarios okay, um, everyone who's healthy is cleared and sent home, and everyone who is sick gets medical attention, okay? 
So, you know, right now, uh, globally, there's this coronavirus pandemic and, and stuff. And, you know, this is a real question that, that's at hand, right? So there's like people on cruise ships and the question is, do we uh, isolate them and quarantine them? Do we send them home? Do we bring them back to the United States? Things like that, right? And so um, those are, the ideal scenario is we can tell exactly who is healthy and then we can send them home and, uh, and we can tell everybody who's sick and we give, you know, do the appropriate steps, right? But we don't have all the information. We don't know everything. We don't know exactly who is healthy and who's not and things like that. And so um, what does it mean to commit a type 1 error and what does it mean to commit a type 2 error? So what is a type 1 error in this scenario? Sick yeah, so a type 1 error is we reject the null, but the null is actually true. So this means this is a healthy person, okay, no, no illness, no virus, no disease, okay, but they get flagged as carrying the disease, okay? So type 1 error is um, a healthy person Um, you know, gets medical treatment. Okay. All right. What is the type 2 error? Yeah. So, uh, so type 2 error is the false negative. Okay. False negative meaning... Um, in this case, a person is actually sick, needs medical attention, but we say, oh, you're fine, and we send them home, okay? So a sick person um, is sent home, okay? Now, neither of these errors are ideal okay we don't want we don't want to commit either type of error but which one is worse what what are the which error has greater consequences type the type 2 error right so we would say the type 2 error is worse than the type 1 okay Okay, and so in this case, do we pick a large alpha or small alpha? Okay, we pick a large alpha. Okay, meaning it only takes, you know, a little bit of evidence for us to kind of come to the conclusion that we reject the null hypothesis, okay? Yes, question. So type 1 errors might be um, more important than type 2 errors. Like the, if a healthy person had a surgery to change their heart or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So, okay. So, you know, coronavirus aside, you know, uh, let's say there's like, um, you know, for like cancer screening, right? So, um, so the, you know, uh, you know, monthly, uh, you know, men, are, men and women are supposed to do self-exams just to kind of check for anything unusual. And, uh, and those things, the self-exams at home have uh, a very high alpha. You know, anything wrong, they say go see a doctor, right? You, uh, you go on WebMD, slightest symptoms, go see a doctor, right, is, is going to be WebMD's recommendation. 
Um, but you know, as, just because you walk into the doctor's office and you show some symptoms, the doctor's not going to say immediately, "Okay, now we need surgery. Now we need to start you on this very uh, um, rough drug, you know, you know, chemotherapy or something that has you know major consequences." There's there's usually a series of tests that you have to kind of go through biopsies and stuff like that um, before they start something you know where where there's serious consequences, right? Yeah. Yeah, obviously we don't want to just say like immediately surgery without further screening. And so those further screenings will have lower and lower alphas just to kind of make sure that we're making the correct decision. But yeah, uh, as you know, as far as being at home and you just type your symptoms into the computer and it says, you know, what should you do? You know, almost all the time it's going to say, go, go see a doctor. There could be something wrong. Okay. Because that's operating with a very high alpha. Only a little bit of evidence for them to say, you know what, let's play it safe. Let's send you to the doctor. Because, um, you know, WebMD's philosophy would be it's worse that, uh, you know, somebody who's sick if they think they're healthy. Okay. And it's the, the consequences of sending a healthy person to the doctor, um, you know, could be inconvenient, but you know, is not going to be life threatening in general. So. All right, is that okay? Yeah, question. Um, yes. So alpha is equal to the probability of type one error. So if you, yeah, no, go on. I'm sorry, when you say alpha controls type 1 error? Yeah, is there, like, is there a calculation? So, okay, so type 1 error is only, uh, so alpha has nothing to do with like the data that you've collected, okay? Alpha only has to do with whether your conclusion is I should reject the null or don't reject the null, right? Because if your p-value comes in under alpha, you're going to say, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis, right? So the data is unaffected by your alpha, okay? But, um, uh, you know, whatever you choose for alpha is going to be whether you, is the threshold at which you say, I'm going to reject the null or I'm not going to reject the null, okay? And, you know, whatever threshold you choose, where when you decide you have enough evidence to reject the null or not is directly related to how often you're going to make this mistake. Okay, because um, at the heart of it, right, um, if, if alpha is 5%, okay, that, um, if we think about it, right, if our p-value comes in at 5%, that means there is a, if our p-value comes in at 5% and that leads us to reject the null or whatever, um, p-value equal to 5% means even when the null hypothesis is true, there's a 5% chance of producing this data just from randomness, okay? Um, so so uh, our choice of alpha is directly related to how often we'll commit type 1 error, but um, it, it has nothing to do with kind of the, the data we've gone through. Yeah, go on. How do we... What do you mean, how do we know the probability of making a type 1 error? Yeah. Um, so you, first of all, we don't know if we've made a type 1 error or not, okay? That's, that's just, uh, we don't know, okay? We just, when we say, my, when I made my decision with alpha equal to 5%, I am accepting an inherent risk that I'm going to be wrong 5% of the time, okay? But we don't, we will never know if we've made a type 1 error or not. And until like we gather more data or we see the population or something, okay? We're always in a situation where all we have access to is the sample of data that we have, and we're hoping our sample of data is representative of the population. But because it was a random sample, sometimes you get weird samples. Sometimes you get weird samples that will make you think this is what's happening in the population, and then in reality, it's different, and, and it's surprising, okay? Um, so, you know, uh, and, you know, the, 
there's like election stuff going on and there's always polling stuff and people are running polls and they say, you know, this is what we think and things like that. And the population is only known until, uh, is not known until election day when after all the ballots come in and all the votes are tallied, okay? Uh, prior to that, everything is just kind of a guess and we're hoping that the samples that we've collected are representative of the actual population, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they lead to wrong conclusions and things like that. So, um, and we don't know. We don't know until the population is revealed. And sometimes the population is never revealed. So, yeah. Sorry. Question. Okay. So this is um, this is a scenario where the type two error is worse. So we would pick a large alpha. Let me um, give a scenario where uh, maybe the type one error is worse. Okay. So we can think of like a criminal trial, okay? In a criminal trial, we um, presume innocence, okay? And so the null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent. And the alternative is that the defendant is guilty. Okay, and uh, ideally, everyone innocent is acquitted. And everyone guilty is con convicted, okay? What would a type 1 error be in this scenario, and what would is a type 2 error? Okay, so type one error is um, the jury convicts uh, an innocent person, right? Okay, and then the type two error would be what? The jury lets a guilty person go free, okay? Okay. And, uh, you know, there's, there's always some debate, you know, maybe some philosophical debate about which of these things are worse, but, you know, our, our justice system is set up to say, uh, that type 1 error is worse. It is worse to convict uh, an innocent person, you know, especially, if, you know, like, uh, well, okay. Um, so, you know, our justice system is set up, you know, uh, kind of with the philosophy that the type 1 error is worse. And so that means we use a small alpha. All right? And they actually, um, or at least in courtroom dramas, <laughs> I've never served on a jury, but, um, you know, uh, they do say, they do tell the jury to use a small alpha in their decision making. Okay, they don't use a, they don't say use a small alpha in your decision making. But what do they say that is basically equivalent to that? Um, 
is a phrase. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, beyond a reasonable doubt. They don't want the jury convicting convicting someone because they just have a hunch or a gut feeling or something. They want um, they want the jury to uh, you know be sure beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, they. Um, So you know we have that right, uh, and I don't know. Uh, this is like several years ago, but I don't know if you guys ever listened to the Serial podcast. Okay, so that you know it it, it was a compelling uh, podcast because you know there was a question was you know did it was a type one error com committed? Right? Uh, I think sometimes on like highly televised trials. Uh, we often see what we believe to be a type two error, um, and you know, in, in both cases, we don't we don't want to make either type one or type two error. But um, but uh, I think you know we'd say that the type one error is worse. Okay, um, so you know, here's like a little thought experiment. What if there was like a you know sometimes um, trials are decided by a single judge. Okay, the judge might make a decision. And what if one day, you know, a judge finds out they, that, you know, uh, that they sent an innocent person to prison, okay? And it turns out, you know, later because of some evidence that the person is exonerated and, you know, the judge has kind of this uh, personal crisis and feels like, oh man, I feel terrible for sending this innocent person to prison. Uh, I never want to make that decision again, okay? How, what is the only way the person that the, this judge can be sure uh, they will never make a type one error again? Uh, never make a type one error. Yeah. And, yeah. The only way the judge can guarantee that they never make a type one error is to never convict. Okay. Um, and then, and then that that's person's no longer a judge, right? That's just that's just like a rubber stamp of not guilty or something, okay? So um, so basically, we can never use alpha equal to zero, okay? Because um, uh, we would never reject the null hypothesis. And just died. Um, you know, likewise, um, the only way for a judge to be sure never to convict or uh, never be sure never to make a type one error. is to never convict. Never convict anyone, okay? And that's, that's just not gonna work. Um, also, the jury never says, we the jury find the defendant innocent. They always say not guilty, okay? In the same way that we never say we accept the null hypothesis, we always say uh, we do not reject the null. Okay, is that is that all right? All right, we've got. Um, if you look at a hypothesis test, a t test, and the confidence interval, um, they're actually like mathematically equivalent. Okay, so a t test for independent samples. 
in a confidence interval. mu1 minus mu2 are mathematically equivalent. Okay. Um, it, it's still important that we learn hypothesis testing because uh, in the future we're going to just we're going to be doing all sorts of different hypothesis tests. Okay, but you know these two things that you know we learned confidence intervals a couple weeks ago, um, and the t-test for independent samples mathematically they they turn out to be um, equivalent. Okay, um, you know in both cases, um, in both methods, we have uh, two samples, two uh, random samples selected independently. And we wish to know, we wish to make a conclusion about their respective populations or the means of their respective populations. Okay, so I will say a, um, I guess I have to specify this, a non-directional hypothesis test. Okay, so non-directional means um, that the alternative hypothesis is mu1 does not equal mu2, okay? Um, Non-directional uses the not equal sign. Okay. Um, Non-directional hypothesis test with significance level alpha is equivalent to a confidence interval. With confidence level equal to one minus alpha. Okay. So you know that is to say a uh, <clears throat> hypothesis test with alpha equal to five percent uh, is equivalent. To a 95% confidence interval. Okay? And then likewise, you know, alpha equal to 0.1% is equivalent to a 99% confidence interval, and so on, etc. All right, so, um, so if the hypothesis test has p-value less than alpha, what do we conclude? If the hypothesis test has a p-value less than alpha, we say we reject the null hypothesis 
and conclude mu1 is different from mu2. If you made a confidence interval for the same data, I'll say a 1 minus alpha confidence interval, with the same data, we would make the same conclusion that mu1 is different from mu2. We would make the same conclusion that mu1 is different from mu2, which means regarding the confidence interval, would 0 be inside or outside of the interval? Yeah, exactly. The, we, we, we can be sure that the confidence interval does not include 0. Okay? We would make the conclu same conclusion that mu1 is different from mu2, um, or we know that the confidence interval does not contain zero. Is that all right? All right, let me give you um, let me give you some practice questions, okay? Okay, so you'll see questions similar to this uh, on the uh, on the quiz next week, okay? All right, so let's say you perform. A hypothesis test um, with alpha equal to 0 0.05. Okay, our conclusion is do not reject the null hypothesis. Right. Okay, so a few questions, all right? Um, what would happen? Well, first of all, what, what can we say about our p-value? Okay, all right. Okay, what would happen if we did the same test If we used the same data and same test but with alpha equal to 1%, okay? Same question, but with alpha equal to 10%, okay? And then if I make a 95% confidence interval for the data, will the confidence interval contain zero? Okay. If I make a 99% confidence interval, will it contain zero? 
and same question but with a 90% confidence interval. All right, so why don't you take a couple of minutes and, uh, and, and answer these questions. And then you can compare with your neighbor. Okay, some of you guys are, might still be thinking about this, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. All right. Okay, so um, uh, we say, uh, let's say we perform a hypothesis test. Uh, we use alpha equal to 5%, and our conclusion is that we do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so first off, right off the bat, what can we say about our p-value? It's greater than 5%. So we don't know what it is, but we do know that the p-value is greater than 0.05. Okay, so this is this is what we know. All right, so if we did the same data, same test, but this time we used alpha equal to 0.01, what would happen? Okay, so if we did the same data and same test, we would come to the exact same p-value. Okay, so this means um, same p-value, which although unknown, we know is greater than 0.05. Okay. Exact value unknown, but it is greater than 0.05, okay? Which means it's going to be greater than this alpha, okay? So, um, so we reject, I'm sorry, we do not reject the null hypothesis. All right, if we, uh, if we did alpha 10%, what, can we say anything? Yeah, so this is uh, unknown, okay? All right, uh, we, do not, um, we do not know if the p-value is greater than alpha or not. Okay. If we make a 95% confidence interval, will the confidence interval contain zero? Yes. Okay. So we concluded, so with alpha equal to 0.05, we did not have evidence of a difference. So that means... A 95% confidence interval contains zero. All right, a 99% confidence interval, okay, that would go along with the 1% alpha, all right? That one also do not reject, so this one will contain zero. And then here, uh, we do not know. Is that okay? All right, I guess another way to think of it is if this is your 95% confidence interval and we know that there's a zero somewhere in between here and here, a 99% confidence interval is just gonna be wider, right? All we do is we just make it wider. So if this thing has zero and I widen it, then this will also have zero, okay? On the other hand, if this has zero and then I go down to a 90% confidence interval, which makes it smaller, it's possible that if you know if zero is close to the edge here, if I make it smaller, it's possible that zero is no longer in the interval. Okay, we don't know. Okay, um, why don't we take a ten-minute break here, and then we'll come back and we'll look at uh, some more stuff.